Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium 2018 podcast. The Big Screen Symposium took place in Auckland on the 26th and 27th of October. Please note, while many of the speakers used clips in their sessions, we've edited these out to better suit the podcast. The Right Honourable Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who is also our Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage, focuses her keynote address on the value of storytellers to New Zealand culture, laying a challenge to government to shift focus from the economic impact of the screen industry to the importance of storytellers and their place in modern society. How does storytelling impact the way we navigate the modern world? And how can we increase access to and participation in the arts in New Zealand? And thank you so much for the opportunity to join you all this morning. Um, I was given uh, a, a set of notes, uh, as, as often is the case when I come to large events like this, uh, where a few thoughts are put in front of me that I might like to share with you. I've chosen not to do that this morning, and so instead I, I hope you'll indulge me uh, if in this room full of storytellers that I just share a few thoughts um, of my own. Uh, and uh, that might mean it's a slightly wide-ranging discussion, but I hope that you'll forgive me for that. There are so many reasons why a government of any shade should be interested in what it is that you do. And one of the things that I find slightly disheartening whenever we talk about actually any part of the sector uh, within arts, culture and heritage, we for some reason have tended to start in recent times a conversation around economic benefit. What it is that you generate or you provide to the economic well-being or the profile of New Zealand in terms of GDP. And in that sense, you stand up in your own right. Absolutely. I mean, I probably don't need to tell you about the $3.5 million billion dollar contribution to GDP or the fact that there are 26,000 jobs in just your part um, of this industry, or the fact that in Auckland revenue grew by 37%. I don't need to tell you that you know it. But also central government, I think, should stop seeing that as the prime motivation for growing your industry. And despite the fact that we periodically have this conversation again and again, particularly when a debate about the incentives regime comes up, and we'll come to that, Despite us continuing to have that debate time and time again, I really want to put that debate um, to bed. Uh, there is no question in my mind the economic value that you bring to this country, to this city, but that for me is not the reason why I consider you important. I consider you important because you are our nation's storytellers. And why does storytelling matter? Well, this is where probably it might come as a surprise to you, but I see there being some... Uh, I guess some synergy between the storytelling you do and the importance of storytelling in what I do. We are living in a world now where in politics, it was probably back in the day of some of my political heroes, the likes of Helen Clark, a time where if you wanted to convince someone of something, you would do it with fact. You would do it with statistics. You would do it with evidence. In fact, if you go back and read some of the maiden speeches of politicians in the past, that is what they are full of. Facts, information, hard arguments around why we should take the country in one direction or another. Now, maiden speeches in Parliament have changed a lot over time. In fact, I remember after I gave mine in Parliament, I said to Helen, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you think of the way that maiden speeches, those first speeches for new MPs, what do you think of them now compared to when you used to sit through Parliament when they, first, uh, when they first started in your era, and she said, mm, there's a lot more emotion, which is true. <laughs> there is a lot more emotion. And look, none of that should ever replace the importance of fact. But we are now living in a world where people even question that, where we used to have a balance between head and heart, but now we have a whole generation that are being overwhelmed with information. We're in our schools. We don't teach the Dewey Decimal System and how to find a book in your library. We teach you how to, when you find an article online, determine whether it's fact or fiction, how to synthesize the information that is coming at you, not out of a tiny hose, but like a fire hydrant. And in amongst that fire hydrant of information, we increasingly have a population globally we're only going to the fire hydrants that spill out things they want to hear. 
And that is a dangerous and difficult place for all of us to be, be it politician, be it consumer. So the battle for the head, for me, feels like we're being, is being lost. The battle based on fact and statistics and information is being muddied and is difficult. And I'm not going to give up on the importance of preserving that, preserving a strong fourth estate, but I am at the same time going to put extra em emphasis on what we do with heart. And that's where storytelling comes in. Now, I'm particularly mindful of this because one of my great passions in politics has always been the issue of child well-being. Perhaps it comes from some of my early experiences growing up. I used to live in a little town called Murupara, and that was a place where even as a, as a little one, I saw the difference between some of the starts in life that kids in New Zealand have, and it made me very passionate, uh, not as a five-year-old. I cared, but I did not understand Rogernomics, not that advanced. <laughs> made me very passionate about issues like child poverty. And I quickly learned as a politician that I could stand on a podium and I could talk about the tens of thousands of children who were statistically living on 60% of the median income or less in New Zealand and therefore falling into the internationally recognised bracket of child poverty. I could do that or I could tell stories. And in telling stories, I noticed that New Zealanders are moved by hearing about the humanity of a situation. And we're so driven by values like fairness that when we hear something unfair happening through storytelling, that was when people were moved. When John Campbell on Radio New Zealand looked into school lunchboxes or talked about kids doing their homework in cars, that was when people were moved by issues of poverty and homelessness, despite the fact that we'd had it for many, many years. Storytelling matters. Maybe my own personal experience with that started a little bit earlier. I studied um, at Waikato University and everyone assumes naturally that someone who is as much of a political self-proclaimed nerd as I am would have studied political science at university. Not so, I actually studied film and television in a little small part of my degree at Waikato University. And I remember studying the work of Galen Preston in War Stories My Mother Never Told Me and being absolutely moved by that piece of work. So much so that I remember taking a tape recorder home and interviewing my family members to try and draw out of them the stories that I felt like I'd missing. And that whole, that changed my whole perspective on another generation. And that is the power of what you do as storytellers, be they fact or fiction. And so for me, the question then becomes... What do we do to create the ecosystem that you need to keep telling stories? And even if they are fictional, ones that reflect back on us, ones that make us laugh, that make us cry, that make us question, that make us start a, I was going to say tape recorder and show my age, that make us act in some form or another, or even just give us a reprieve from our daily lives. How do we create that ecosystem for you? Well, I want to acknowledge the role that the Film Commission plays, acknowledge the 40 years that we're celebrating for the Film Commission, and that they've seen that if we are going to create the, that ecosystem, we need to make sure it's an ecosystem that reflects Aotearoa New Zealand. It needs to be diverse. It needs to support women. It needs to make sure that they are in every level of, uh, of the business, and they've done that through things like the 125 Fund, and they have done it through the specific funding for Māori filmmakers, particularly making films in Te Reo Māori. But we need to do more of that, because if we're telling our stories, they need to be all of our stories. What else do we need to do to create that ecosystem? Well, this is where I'm going to come back to what we can do in central government. Firstly, we need to start early. And I'd say this for all of the arts, culture and heritage sector. Whenever I talk about these issues, they'll ask me what we're doing in education. And they're absolutely right. What are we doing to foster a child's mind and imagination? What are we doing to make sure that they can see that there is a career prospect for them in the arts, no matter what part of it it may be? And instead of just saying that STEM subjects matter, actually talking about STEAM, that arts deserves to be in the centre of us preparing for our future challenges and di digital and technological disruption. Because in my mind... Because in my mind in the future, the only thing that's going to separate us from machine is going to be our imagination and our creativity. So I'm all for fostering an education system 
that has, uh, that has a place for play, uh, that has inquiry-based learning, and that's exactly the direction uh, that we're looking to take. So it's, it is taking us a bit to modernise and turn the ship around, but I hope you'll see that uh, in some of the things we'll be doing in the future and hopefully in the budget as well, a bit of a focus on that area. So starting early is number one. Started number two is access. When I first came in as Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage, um, I picked that one for myself, uh, I said to the team that access was critical to me. Now, in part, that's because I grew up in small town New Zealand, population of 5,000, and I still remember the point as a 17, 16-year-old well, we piled on a school bus and drove to Auckland to the Maidman oh. Theatre to watch my first professional play put on by Auckland Theatre Company of the Crucible. It had such a huge effect on me that I'm constantly aware of what access we give to young, to old, to lower socioeconomic, to rural, to urban, to those with disability and those with ability. This is about being across the board, enabling access to arts, culture and heritage. And when it comes to access, uh, there is much that we can do. Creative New Zealand have been fantastic, though, in responding to our call by at least starting out by giving us more data to tell us where we're reaching and where we're not. The second is career pathways. We used to have a scheme called Pathways to Arts and, Arts and Cultural Employment. Some of you might remember it. It was called PACE. It was our way of acknowledging that we weren't doing enough to support uh, those in the creative sector to, uh, to monetize their trade, um, to not have to be forced by work and income into um, areas of work that did not make the most of their creative talents and abilities. Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage is working as we speak on trying to reinvigorate those pathways and is looking again at pace. And we'll have more to say on that down the track too. Fourth. The fourth is supporting the screen industry specifically, though. What can we do to support different industries, but here, particularly yours? You might remember that there was some debate some time ago around the use of incentive regimes. Now, in my mind, if New Zealand is going to be a player uh, in the film and television industry at an international level, there is no debate. If you want to be in, you have an incentives regime. It's the only way we can compete. So there is no question for me, no matter how many MB reports are, draw, uh, are drawn up and produced, I will not be convinced otherwise. We have to have one, and it has to be competitive. And so that's a message I wanted to share with all of you, um, that in spite of the fact that we do still have that debate in the media domain, there is no change of perspective from this government on the use of incentive regimes. If we want an industry, they're here to stay. But we have to make sure it's dynamic, it's responsive, it's working, it gives certainty. And there's a whole lot of things in there that probably we could do well to actually talk to you about what's required to make sure that it's working for us domestically and internationally. And creating that domestic ecosystem that is actually one of the biggest benefits in my mind to its existence in the first place. So what are we doing to make sure we're employing our local people, that uh, we're, we're using the benefits of that international presence to benefit our domestic industry? Now for that, I need the input of the sector. We said before the election we wanted to create a 10-year uh, screen industry strategy. Now, Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage came to me recently and said, how do you want to drive it? I said, I don't. I want the industry to drive it. This will be an industry-led strategy, and we've started the work already. But if you see that coming to uh, a workplace near you in the future, please take the opportunity. We're really genuine in wanting to hear from you what will it take to give the stability to the sector that has not existed uh, the stability, I, I, I mean, has not quite been there as much as it could have been over the last decade. How do we give that assurance going forward so that we can only continue to drive um, and to grow what I think is an incredible sector for New Zealand? So those are my unscripted thoughts. I do hope, though, that um, this time that you have together, I always hear so many wonderful things about the symposium. I hope that this time that you have together is a time where you're able to spend a little time, get the creative juices flowing, thinking about some of the challenges that we collectively face. And they're not confined, uh, as I've set out in the beginning of my view, uh, 
you are tipping now over into some of the global challenges we're facing. Whether you like it or not, that's the, that's the position I'm putting you in. Please help us keep telling our stories. We need you now more than ever, as much for the reprieve as it is for the social change. Kia ora koutou kato and tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. The Big Screen Symposium is brought to you by Script to Screen and Janda. We would like to thank our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, Images and Sound, Screen Auckland and Stage and Screen Travel Services. Voiceover was provided by Samantha Dukes and music by Poddington Bear.